happy Palm Sunday. It's going to be a wonderful time for us to worship and to grow together. As I was praying over this message, I thought there's, there's three things primarily that we should do, not just while we're here at church, but that we should be doing all of today. One, that we can rejoice in the King. Amen? Some of you are awake. Good. We can rejoice in the King. Amen? Amen. We can reflect back as to what he did and why he did what he did. And then for us to grow, whether you've been uh, in the faith for 30 years or 30 seconds, or you have no idea who Jesus is, uh, it is important that each of us grow in our understanding of who he is and what he wants from each one of us. And so in the theme of growing, as I was studying and as I was doing my prep and I was looking at what did I preach on la last Palm Sunday? Let me go back. Re rewind all the way back to last Palm Sunday. What did I teach? And how well did it go? Eh, it was all right. It wasn't, wasn't terrible. But it got me to thinking, how many events, think about an event, like a moment, are show up in all four of the Gospels. So, so think about it for a second. Four different authors, four different target groups for who the Gospel was written to, so four different Gospels. How many events show up in each of the Gospels? So these are things, these are moments in Jesus' life that each of the writers said, this is so important, it's got to make it into my Gospel for this audience. How many? So think, think about it. You can blurt it out in just a second. So there's two kinds of people when it comes to telling a story, right? There's uh, myself, I, I, I jump into the story and hand motions. My wife jokes that if I sat on my hands, I couldn't actually tell the story. And then I get like all the details. We get into it. Like, I want you to feel like you're sitting right there while this is happening. And my wife's like, skip to the end. I'm telling the story. How many do you think? How many events find themselves in all four Gospels? Five, five events in all four Gospels? Okay, I, I hear five, I hear five. I hear six in the back, six in the back. I hear, I hear four in the front. Nope, not, not four. How many? Ten, I hear ten. Ten up front, ten going once, going twice. Ten, seven, okay? I found... 12. There are 12 events that are in all of the Gospels. And some of you, if you look up at the list, you're like, wait a second, he's cheating. He took one event and he made it. He split it into two. So Jesus entering into the ministry happens in all the Gospels. John baptizing Jesus, that critical moment happens in all the Gospels. Jesus feeding the 5,000, not both times he fed them, but just the 5,000, finds itself in all four Gospels. The triumphal entry, Jesus making that, that trek from uh, Bethany, where Lazarus lives, in, on the donkey, entering into Jerusalem, finds itself in all four Gospels. All of the writers thought this was so important, they had to include this in the Gospel for you and for me to read. The Last Supper obviously lands in all four. The arrest of Jesus, obviously. Peter's denial of Jesus in all four Gospels. Um, the arrest of Jesus, his sentencing, his crucifixion, and his death, and I split those two because different moments that, that happen, the burial of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Those 12 events are critical to understanding what the gospel is, and the triumphal entry is what we're celebrating, what we're looking at today. So we're going to be reading in Luke chapter 19. So if you want to pull out your phone and you want to pull up Luke 19, we're going to read the passage together. But again, I wanted to show you, these are the four different places and the, the four different flavors of the exact same story of what we see. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. I'll uh, begin. I'm reading in the New King James, if you're wondering. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near Bethphage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? You shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said it to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of, of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. That was one of our focus points from last year. If you'll remember, lots, lots of fun we had with the idea of, of the colt. Then they brought him to Jesus. And they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road, then as they were drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, a whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. 
But he answered them and said, I tell you that if they should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out, this is God's word. Such an incredible story, and I wish we had time to go into all of the little details, but we would be here all day. So I thought, let's take a look at what this might have looked like. Volume all the way up. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Praise God. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, just as the scripture says. Do not be afraid, city of Zion. Here comes your king, riding on a young donkey. His disciples did not understand this at the time. But when Jesus had been raised to glory, they remembered that the scripture said this about him and that they had done this for him. The people who had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from death had reported what had happened. That was why the crowd met him, because they heard he had performed this miracle. Pharisees then said to one another, You see, we are not succeeding at all. Look, the whole world is following him. This is the day the king arrives in Jerusalem. This is the day that was prophesied in Daniel, that the prophet Zechariah prophesied would happen exactly as he prophesied it would happen. The king had arrived. And you notice the Pharisees are watching this and, and the enemy connived. They're, and the whole world is going after him. What are we going to do? The enemy is, is connived and the people thrived. Yes, I worked, I worked on this part of the message for a long time. Did you know there's only 45 words in the English language that end in I-V-E-D? And trying to get them to match up, it was, it was a hard, the king arrived, the enemy connived, the people thrived. <laughs> right, we got it, okay, so. Uh, not a competitive Scrabble player at all, like not, not even a little bit, not even a little bit. So for those of you that have not been to Jerusalem, I'm assuming most of you, I have not yet been to Jerusalem, but maybe one day you and I can go together. Bethany, if you look up on your map, Bethany, that's the city over here, right? It's, it's on this side of Jerusalem. Is, he's going from Bethany. He's going through Bethphage. He's going down the valley. No matter which direction you come from, you always go up to Jerusalem because of the valleys. I actually pulled a topographical map. You, you're always going up to Jerusalem. So he's going, he's going through Bethphage, down the Mount of Olives, and he's ascending into Jerusalem. And the people are elated. And in the same way as they laid things down, we're going to be called today together to lay things down to surrender things to the king, to worship him because he's worthy of all of our worship. The triumphal entry as he went in to Jerusalem, if you're looking at the map, there's two things I want you to notice. One, see that huge square right there? That is the temple. The temple. Yes, you've got it, the temple. And then over on the other side, this ugly little square right there that looks kind of like a brick, a little ugly brick, that's the praetorium. That's where the Romans are. When Jesus enters into Jerusalem, the people have a very certain expectation of who he is and what he will do. And what do you think they want him to do? What do you think the Israelites want Jesus? They want him to go into Jerusalem. They want him to turn to the right. Turn to the right and go destroy the Romans. The, the, the man that can walk on water, the man that can multiply and feed 5,000, the man who can bring back the dead. Oh, the Romans would be no problem. He can squash them like a bug. Let's do this, Jesus. Let's squash those Roman, uh, destroy them. They're oppressing our people. That was their expectation. They had this expectation of what they want Jesus to do. But Jesus doesn't turn to the right. He doesn't go to the praetorium. He doesn't squash Rome. He turns to the left. 
And what do you think Jesus finds when he turns to the left and he goes to the temple in this precious place where God is to be worshipped and revered, where there is a court for the Gentiles, right? The Gentiles, which is uh, us pagan, heathen, non-Jewish people to come and to know Yahweh. He comes to that place. He fulfills this prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Rejoice, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just having salvation, lowly riding on a donkey, the colt, full of a donkey. He doesn't come in might. He doesn't draw the sword. He comes in humility into Jerusalem. And so people are puzzled. They're, they're confused. They're expecting a tidal wave of him booting the Romans and never having to deal with Rome again. And what does he come? He comes as, as the lowly king. They, they're expecting him to be Superman. Da, 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 right? Uh, faster than a, a speeding bullet. Jumps higher than... Well, you know what I mean. You, you're getting... Their expectation of him is to rescue. They want Superman. Not mild-mannered Clark Kent with his glasses. They, they want the, the deliverance now. Deliver now is what they want. And so when we look back at the passage and we're, we're careful to look at the words that Zechariah is telling us, he came to bring, he came to bring justice. You've got it, Missy. He came to bring salvation because we need it. We need salvation. And he came in a way to bring humility. He was humble. Justice, salvation, humility, not just for the Jewish people, not just for the city of Jerusalem, but for the whole world and for all of time. He came for that purpose, which is grander than their thinking because they're so focused on the right here and the right now. And so he goes in, he rides on this young donkey, a colt, a male colt of a donkey, rides on the donkey into Jerusalem. He makes that left turn, he goes into the temple. And what does he find? What are they doing in the temple? Yeah, they're gambling. It's like gambling. It's just like gambling, right? So um, Matthew, uh, Matthew's account records and says, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? And the crowds are saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, let's take just a moment and let's see when Jesus enters the temple what could it have looked like for Jesus to come into the temple and to see what's going on? There in the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and pigeons and also the money changers sitting at their tables. I love that dramatization to say he cleansed the temple. Now, for some of us that, that don't know the context, that seems really mean of Jesus. Jesus, that was really mean. Like what? Jesus is on, on the attack. Jesus is, is driving them out. Uh, uh, the scripture tells us he used a three-branded cord. So he didn't just say, 
excuse me, it is time for you to move out of the temple. That was not Jesus. He, here, hold this cord. And uh, he braided that three, three thronged cord and he drove them out with a whip. Jesus goes on the offensive. Jesus goes on the attack. Now you have to ask yourself, if, if this is enough to upset Jesus to this level, what is it really that's upsetting Jesus? He didn't come to hurt people. He came to attack sin. They had filled the Gentiles' court, the place where you and I are supposed to be able to worship Almighty God and get to know Him, and they filled it with, with goats and sheep and pigeons and money-changing tables where you could be ripped off for the price of $9.99. We'll rip you off. Uh, you couldn't use your, your denarius. You couldn't use pagan money in the temple. No, you've got to exchange that pagan money for the temple shekel. And uh, the going rate for a temple shekel is, yeah. and they would do all of their calculations and guess who uh, landed up all the richer on their calculations? They had turned what is supposed to be a place of prayer into a market, into a den for thieves and robbers. Their, their hearts were filled with greed and sin. And so Jesus very clearly says, out with this. Now Jerusalem and the Jews, the Israelites were expecting Jesus to come in and kick the Romans out for the Romans' sin. Get, get rid of those filthy Romans who are sinning against us. But what does Jesus do? He makes that left turn. He goes into the temple and he cleans out their sin. How often in our lives do we have the same dynamic? Think about it. When you look at someone else's life or you see something on Facebook that you're just like, ah, and you're like, sin right over here. Jesus, clean out this person's sin. And Jesus says, have you looked in your heart today? Have you taken some time to let my light shine into your life, into the, your body that is the temple? Have you let the, my light shine in you and show you the greed or what's going on in here? So often we're, we're, we want other people to turn from their sin, and that's good. That's a, that's a right thing. But oftentimes Jesus turns that light a little bit and says, what's going on in your heart, in my heart, that we may be pure and right before him? And Jesus does not play around with sin. This is what Herod's temple would have looked like in about 32 AD, and we call it Herod's temple because he's the one that beautified the project. He was known for his building projects and making it magnificent to the eyes. And again, they, they had stuffed this court over here on that side is where the Gentiles were supposed to come to know God. And they had crammed it, filled with birds and livestock and money-changing tables, and market, mar market business. They had pushed God's purpose out, and they'd filled it with commerce. And, and Jesus had none of it. Jesus was not going to let them get away with it. So I wanted to ask you this morning to take just a few moments with me. And with everyone's head bowed and with all of our eyes closed, I want you to take a moment between you and the Lord. I want you to pause what you're doing and I want you to focus on what he wants you to hear and what's going on in your heart. And I want you to ask him to convict and drive out sin. So give it, give it just one moment. Don't, don't run past this moment. Don't be distracted in this moment. Listen carefully for his still, small voice and let him speak to your heart right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we come to you needing your touch, needing you to cleanse the temple that you have given us, uh, our heart, our body, our mind. And we pray right now that you would convict us of sin, that you would make us aware of the desires in our heart that don't line up with what you want. And Jesus, help us to give no quarter to sin, to give no inch to the enemy but to let you drive out all that doesn't belong and to restore the love and the peace, the salvation and the grace that you want in our hearts, 
in our minds, in our lives, in our families. Set us right today. In Jesus' name. As we circle back to our, our passage in Luke, you thought we were done with Luke. We're not even close to done with Luke. We're going to make three careful observations and points about worshiping the king because this day is a day for worship. Every day that he gives us is a day that we get to worship him. They brought him then, then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as they went up, many spread their clothes on the road and he went now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen costly worship. And David once was recorded as saying, I will not offer to God that which would cost me nothing. We are to lay down the very best of who we are and what we have for him. Worship costs you something. It costs you something. Sometimes it costs us time. You know, we take the time to worship. Uh, there's a time when he says, I want you to go and to do this thing. There's some times where he pushes us out of our comfort zone to say, I want you to go and invite someone to church. And some of you are thinking, oh, I could never do that. If that is what Jesus is calling you to do, that is the act of worship that he is asking and instructing you. Worship costs you something. But we shouldn't stray away from what does worship gain us? It fills our, our mind and it fills our heart with a presence of who he is and what he wants for us. It costs us something. We have to, the, the disciples lay down their coats. And what is Jesus calling us to lay down today? Verse 38 says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest focused worship. He wants our focus and our aim to be on him. At the very end of our life, when, when we are on our deathbed and when we're saying our goodbyes and we're reflecting back on the life that we have lived, did we focus our life and mind and heart on worshiping the king or were we selfishly driving after all of what we want and ignoring what Jesus wants? Worship is to be focused and our focus is him. Some of the Pharisees called to him and said, "'Teacher, rebuke your disciples.'" But he answered them and said, I tell you the truth. <clears throat> if these should be silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I almost wish he had silenced them for a minute to hear what song would have come from the stones to worship the king. In case you didn't realize, the entire world, the, the entire universe is set up to worship the king. Everything in it. Psalms 19, one says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Everything points to him, down from the smallest atom up to the, the galaxies that spin in exactly as he has, has called them to spin. Everything worships him and points to him. Why wouldn't we also do the same? And so I want to introduce you to Jesus today. Because if you're not walking with Jesus, today is the day that he is knocking on the door of your heart. He's saying, come, follow me. And the cost of coming and following him is laying down what was and walking with him. And if you were one of those ones, and I know so many of you have already been introduced to Jesus, you say, this is not for me, but it is for you. Because oftentimes he calls us to introduce someone else to Jesus. In, in our story right here, uh, by the, the cleansing of the temple, a bunch of Greeks, not Jews, came up to one of the disciples and said, we would like to meet Jesus. And so Andrew says, we'll make that happen, and arranges their meeting with Jesus. It is the greatest privilege that we get to have as believers, as the family of God, the amazing privilege of saying, I get to make this introduction this person and Jesus, and I, I get to find what is it going to take to bring this person to knowing who he is, that great introduction. And soft, easy way, because it's Easter, invite someone to church where that you know they're going to hear the gospel and where we know we're going to have really good food and fellowship. Invite them and see what they say. You never know what God is going to do with a simple invitation or simple introduction. The second thing I want to remind us of is laying down. 
There are times and seasons in our life where Jesus calls us to lay something down in order to take something up. He's called us to to lay down our wants and our dreams. And he's called us to take up his dreams, which are so much better than you could even imagine. Taking up the cross and following him, and not just now, but now for eternity. And the last thing I want to remind us of as we call the band up is to reflect and to worship. If Jesus is in fact knocking, go ahead, Ben, come on up. As Jesus is knocking on the door, will you open and invite him in and have a meal with your Savior? Is that something that you're willing to do today? Are you too ashamed? You're like, I don't know. (laughs) Are you worried of what he's going to find when he steps into your home? Are you worried what what the shape of your heart is going to look like when Jesus says, we're going to do a project here. It's going to be a a renovation of the heart project we're going to do. Jesus is knocking on the door and saying, come in. You belong with me. He says to you and he says to me, you are mine. And those are the most sweet and the most beautiful words. He reminds you and me that we belong to him as his beloved. No matter what mistakes you've made this week, this, this month in your life, Jesus calls to you and he calls to me and he says, come, let me make it right. You notice nowhere in this message, in this passage, do we get to attack sin. That's not our, our job. Is, our job is not to go on the offensive, put on the boxing gloves. Our job is to let Jesus attack sin for us on our behalf. He is so much better at that than we could ever imagine or be. Jesus is knocking. Are you going to answer? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your heart for us. And I pray for those that that need to say yes to you again. I pray for those just like I was who needed several moments of saying yes to you, understanding both who you are and what you want and the laying down of our rights the laying down of our wants, the laying down of our hopes and dreams, and the taking up of the kingdom. And I pray for for those of us that, that need to say yes again to you. And I pray, Lord God, that they would, by faith, reach out today. They would confess their sin and walk in your ways, Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much for your heart for each of us and that you are one heartbeat away I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. I thank you so much that we get to worship together. We get to grow together today. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a beautiful thing to be loved by the king, amen? Amen. All right, for our closing blessing, I'm gonna need Eric's help. Eric, can I get your help? Eric, can you help me with a closing blessing? Can you help me? So I want you to stand up on your feet. I went, can you open up your hands? So you're going to show the adults how, open, can you open your hands? Open your hands, just like that? Just like that? Yeah, yes. Imagine, imagine I'm going to put something into your hands. I'm going to put something into your hands. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Just like that. Boom. Oh, I dropped it. Okay. So open your hands as though, yeah, right. Hold it, hold it in your hands. Hold it. Turn. Turn, 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 turn. There, stop. Right there. There we go. For those that are unfamiliar, <laughs> A benediction is the blessing that comes from his word. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, that is his smile, upon you this day. And may he give you his peace.